Welcome to the Team Engagement Podcast, where leaders of teams share their insights. We discuss five questions in about 10 minutes, and I am very excited to introduce our guest today. This is Emily Levitt. She is the founder and CEO of Utah Balloon Creations out of Payson, Utah. And Emily, this is such a great, I've, I've said this many times as we've talked over the months and years that we've gotten to know each other, how much I love your business. I just think it's so cool, so much fun. But tell the folks a little bit more about Utah Balloon Creations and what it is that makes your business so cool. Well, as you said, we are Utah Balloon Creations. So we are literally a Utah-based business and we create um, balloon decor of all different shapes and sizes. We do both corporate and private events, but we really specialize in making large statement pieces such as balloon arches or um, custom sculptures for really any kind of function you can imagine. So from the big corporate functions to intimate gatherings, we just try and make every occasion really memorable. That's just awesome. I just love it because you don't think about it, but there are balloons everywhere and often very mm -hmm. creative structures of balloons and that's what you guys do and that's why I love it so much because it's one of those wow you see it all the time but you don't ever think about it. somebody's got to do it so exactly that's awesome <laughs> great all right well let's jump to our questions and kind of talk a little bit about your insights into leadership and teams so our first question uh, Emily if you would share with the audience a time when you had a conflict with either a coworker, or a colleague or something and how you resolved it so this is kind of an interesting question because I feel like I was really racking my brain for when have I had a conflict with a coworker, and I, I don't think I can place a specific time where I have, but I have had moments where I've had colleagues that have had really big issues with each other, and I have always kind of been the mediator mm -hmm. with that, and, and I kind of attribute that to the fact that I have always been very, um, very pro-direct communication, and so Ever since I was young, this is something that my my mom instilled in me. And so I think that's why I couldn't pinpoint a time when I've had a big struggle with a coworker because I've always just thought, okay, if there's an issue, we're just going to sit down and talk about it. And so as long as you are open and communicating with someone, um, I was able to help these two that I worked in an office with resolve their conflicts because they would both come to me. And I looked at them and I said, this is silly you guys need to talk to each other. Why are you coming to me? Tell this to her. You guys talk to each other. And, it, and it's worked out really well. I really appreciate that example because sometimes we forget that it's not just our own conflicts that sometimes come up, but as leaders, we often have to mediate. We often have to kind of help the, the employees or the team members work it out with each other. So that's a great example. Thanks for sharing that. Now, Emily, question number two, I'm sure you've heard the phrase, people don't leave jobs, they leave managers. What is one suggestion that you can offer to leaders to help them retain their talent a little bit longer? Um, for me, I would say allow people to struggle, but guide them with a patient hand. So, mm -hmm. so for me, it's always been, um, I, I find myself frustrated when those who are managing me or leading me will give me an assignment, but then essentially come over and do it for us, right? So they, they say, here's what you're going to do, but then they're always kind of micromanaging, interjecting, because they want to be able to have it done the exact same way. Now, there's obviously a place for consistency and uniformity and having things done the correct way, but you also have to allow people to bring in their own strengths and use their own personality to basically do what you've hired them to do. Um, that, that's why you hire them, to be able to bring their own unique spin to things. So allow them to come in, do what they need to do, and it's gonna take some time, but allow them to figure out their own way of doing it and proceed from there. Wow, that is such a great comment because that is, for a lot of leaders, that's really difficult to allow their person, their, their employees, their team members to struggle a little bit. And I love how you said that to, to kind of guide them with a patient hand. I think that's a great way to look at it because that's exactly what leaders need to do to help their people really thrive and reach far higher heights than they would have if they were just doing whatever they were told to the nth degree there. So great comment. Love that one. Question number three, how can leaders help build resilience in a team? I feel like this answer kind of goes along with the last question uh, and how I answered that is um, to allow what 
what we would deem as failures, right? So I think it's important to be able to accept and also share that we, we have struggled and we have failed as well and make space for that within your team. So um, in my line of work, we do a lot of hands-on. Um, I don't expect anyone to be able to come in and just magically know how to do all of these things. It's something that takes time, it takes practice. Um, and also, you know, we, we go and set up events. And so sometimes weather will throw a curveball in there. And um, it's super windy and nothing's standing up or it's not looking exactly how we wanted it to be. And that can be incredibly frustrating, but it's something that you have to be able to stop and analyze the situation and go, okay, where do we go from here? And, and I personally have been very open with my team to share experiences that I've had where I've gone and done these setups and it did not go as planned, you know, or, or this happened and that happened and that's okay. And that's going to happen. It's how you take that and learn from it and grow so that next time, ooh, I gotta make sure that I, I have this with me as a backup, or I have to make sure to allow extra time for this. Um, how you can take that and grow to be able to change how you act in the future. That's a great answer. And it's, it is a challenge for leaders to let their people fail sometimes. And not that, not that any of us are trying to fail deliberately, but things are going to happen. And I like how you said that, that you can also share that, that gives you an opportunity as a leader to share when you've struggled in the past and how you solved it and accelerate that learning curve a little bit. That's a great response. All right, exactly. question. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Anything else? Oh, I was just going to, I was just going to say, so I was also a fourth grade teacher prior to this. Um, and I'm a mom of three children. And it's really no different than raising children in that aspect of you look at them struggle, you're trying to watch them grow, and you're trying to teach them how to be resilient. They have to be able to fail. And you also have to be able to step back and apologize when you've done something wrong. I'm sorry that I raised my voice and I lost my temper. I was out of line there. you know. And we, we both ask forgiveness from each other. We both ask for you know, some, some mercy from the other person to be able to recognize, okay, I'm not perfect. I've got to be able to take this and learn and grow. Great, great analogy in comparison because leadership in a family is just as important as leadership in the corporate world because the same yeah, principles. Yeah, they really correlate. Yeah, mm -hmm. they really do. All right, question number four, is there someone that you would like to recognize that has had an influence of some kind in your life? There have been more people than I can count um, that have influenced my life for the better. Um, I was trying to think of a really obscure kind of reference because, I mean, obviously my parents, uh, my husband, every, all these people have impacted me in, in wonderful ways. But I was thinking back to when I was in college and I had a class that um, it was focusing on, it was actually called drama in the elementary classroom because it was talking about creativity and putting on plays literally in the elementary classroom. Um, and she had us take a book that had a quiz in it and it was all about your personality. It sorted our class into four different colors of what your personality is like. And I think that that was the first time that I realized how different people can be. And I, you know, you always know that, well, everyone's different, everyone's unique. But when I realized that I was in a very small section of the, of my class, as far as what personality type I fit in, I realized, oh, I might be cut a little bit from a different class here. <laughs> um, and, and that things that I view as things that I enjoy, or I like to do, that is totally something other people don't like to do. And the high adventure, crazy things that other people like to do is definitely not my speed. So I think that was one of the first times that I was able to stop and kind of recognize, okay, people are very different. I don't necessarily have to take this traditional path that's laid out for everyone. Um, there's a lot of safety and security in it, but I am a very creatively minded person. I, I don't like the same thing day after day. And so it was very eye-opening and refreshing for me to be able to see that there are so many different personality types. And I think that I've also brought that with me in, in building my business, being able to bring in different people that have the different strengths and letting them do what they've been hired to do. Well, that's a great example of, of all those things that you said about the people that have influenced you, as well as how you're able to turn around and influence them. I love that. So, <laughs> all right, our last question, tell us a little bit about your first job. 
So my first job, um, I was, let's see, 16 years old and um, I grew up in New Jersey. So my, my dad owned a heating and air conditioning company. Um, he also owned a little auto shop and a gas station. It was kind of this business of three. And so I would just go in after school and um, I did basically data entry, clerical work, filed a lot of papers and it was a great environment. I loved everyone that was there, uh, but it was also the first time that I kind of looked around and went, I do not want to do this for the rest of my life. <laughs> so it's a wonderful job for those who thrive in that environment. But I would, um, I became really close with my two coworkers, but this is what they did every day. They would w wake up, drive to this office, sit in this cubicle, go through the same papers, do the same things. And I just thought, oh, that is going to be so boring. I do not want that for my life. Um, they loved it. They thrived in it, which was wonderful. But I kind of got the sense of this is not going to be my path. And I tried to fit in that mold for a little while after that. I, I tried to do the, the normal jobs um, that I would last about maybe a year, if that. And then I'd be like, I got to get out of here. <laughs> So, th so I think that that was one of the first times that I realized, okay, um, this is what I may be supposed to do, and I don't really want to. And then once I got to college and started having those experiences, like in my drama class, where I realized, okay, there's going to be different options. There's going to be different doors that open to me, or I can open them myself, but I'm going to figure out a different way to do things. So that's kind of how we ended up here. <laughs> I love that. And it's been, it's been interesting for me as, as the host of the podcast to have all these guests come on and I ask that question and I get one of two responses, either one that was kind of their beginning to the, what is now their career and what they're doing as far as business and that they loved what they did. And sometimes it's because of their family owned business that they had when they were growing up. But you also have the folks like you that said, you know, I had this job and I realized that was not what I wanted to do with my yeah. life. <laughs> Whatever it was, that was like, I do not want to do this. And so there's, yeah. there's real value in both exactly. sides of that, uh, that argument. I, That's great. I had a great example in my dad because it was his own business. He had started it. He runs this. And so I had from a very young age, a, an example of you can do your own thing. You can be your own entrepreneur. Um, and so he was that. Um, he was doing not what I wanted to do, but it was still a good example as to, I can choose how I want to do this and what I want to do with my life. Oh, that's great. I love that. Love that entrepreneurial spirit. Well, Emily, <laughs> thank you so much for being on the podcast today. How can people find you? So you can find us primarily on our website. It's utahballooncreations.com. Um, or we're also available on Instagram. That's a very popular one right now because what we do, you see a lot of our pictures. So um, you can check us out on Instagram at Utah Balloon Creations. Is it Utah Balloon Creations with an S? Yes. Okay. Yes, with an S. Mm -hmm. Very good. This is Sean Richards with the Team Engagement Podcast, where leaders of teams share their insights. For more ideas, go to teamengagementpodcast.com. And we also invite you to subscribe or follow the podcast, either the audio or the video version on YouTube. Thanks so much for joining us today. Have a great day.